Thank you for joining us. Thank you for staying from the last press conference we just had, if you've stayed. I'm the host of these unusual press conferences, which I call the Climate Matters TV show. My name's Stuart Scott. We're coming to you from COP22 in Marrakesh, Morocco. I like to give my email address at the beginning and end of these shows so people can get in touch if they want to. I get usually very relevant communication, so thank you. Today's topic, the Arctic crisis. And today's guests, Dr. Peter Wadhams, an emeritus professor of ocean physics from Cambridge University, and his wife, Maria Pia Casarini Wadhams, who's the director of the Italian Institute of Polar Geography and the editor of its journal, Il Polo. This is Mr. and Mrs. Wadhams on expedition to the Arctic. And she told me a cute story how they delayed their wedding because of a trip she didn't want to get married in the Arctic. This is Peter's book, which I showed in the last press conference. And this is Maria Casarini's Il Polo. It's a quarterly publication, all about the Arctic from not scientific as much as social scientific perspectives, the people up there, the lives. Now, I wanted to start off showing one of the changes in the Arctic. And these are the methane plumes. That was from 2007, and there's an increased number of them every year. Here's another one of the images of methane from underneath. I think Peter said it was Russian. And this is from a sideward-looking sonar under the water looking at methane plumes coming from the East Siberian Arctic shelf. This has been called the Arctic Death Spiral. It's a rotary view over the years of what's going on and the decrease of ice in the Arctic. The color coding is the different months of the year. The black would be late summer, September. And these are just a couple of slides. This is 2016, the Arctic extent. The black is tracking the red, which is the 2012 record. And I believe Peter said that it actually met the 2012 record. And this is the Greenland ice cover in July of 2012, July 1st. And only 10 days later, almost the entire surface of Greenland exhibited melting. Did not melt completely, obviously, but started to look like that. Now, I'm going to switch to a presentation that Maria Pia has given me, if you'll take it away. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be present here and talk about something that is very dear to our Polar Institute in Italy from our founder, Professor Zavatti, who really um, had very much at heart the dangers in which the life of the Inuit was being threatened in the 50s, in the 1950s, and in a way still can be so. Uh, climate change is changing the lives of people all over the world, uh, but in the Arctic is a much more sensitive area, and therefore we can see the various states that belong to the Arctic, uh, Siberia and Russia to the right, Canada, United States with Alaska on the left, plus the Scandinavian countries, we'll talk about that later on with the Arctic Council. What is more dangerous now is that the Inuit live still traditionally hunt, although they may have adopted some Western ways of uh, living in the Arctic, they still value very much the traditional life. And uh, it's a skill that is passed on down the generations. And one of the dangers that happens now with the thinning of sea ice is that, for instance, the hunting season is shorter because the ice is still Dinner, and the skidoo, the uh, snowmobiles are heavy, and there have been uh, reports of serious accidents with loss of life. And uh, even dogs and sledges that are still used, this uh, was taken in northern Greenland in Kanak, they still have to be very, very careful about uh, the way that they hunt. These are very beautiful pictures that I was sent by Acacia Johnson, an artist uh, photographer of Canadian origin and this we'll see in the winter of Arctic Bay where she spent a year um, hunting for seals. This is a very beautiful image of ice fishing in the winter. 
UK gear, that's Siberia. Subanka Banerjee sent me this very interesting picture, and you notice the difference between Siberia with the trees and the tundra behind, as opposed to the Arctic, which is pure ice. And very important is uh, whale hunting, because uh, it's being done almost ritually, and there is always this respect, the respect for the animal that gives its life to allow the Inuit to live. And this is what distinguishes the natives. Here it's a very poignant image. I find these Inupiat people that are praying after having hunted the whale. That would give them sustenance. Also, the caribou is very important for food, for the Arctic, and because of climate change, also the roads that the caribou groups follow sometimes change, making it quite difficult for the, uh, for the animals to be intercepted by the groups of Inuit. The Guichin are returning to Old Crow, which is a small village in the Yukon, and uh, also other animals, which of course is, uh, people are more familiar, is the problems with polar bears and the plight of the polar bears. And we can see this is a marginalized zone in summer in the Greenland Sea. And this was actually a photograph that my husband Peter took when he did a BBC program in Baffin Bay. And this so it looks like a dog almost is sitting on an iceberg and this polar bear is going to starve because there was no way that he could get any food apart from scientists, and scientists were kind of careful not to be eaten by the polar bears. So things, as we say, are changing. This sums up quite well what we're saying, that the ice, uh, sea ice is forming later, melting earlier. There could be a tradition, loss of traditional way of life. Economies are changing. Uh, pressures from industry and also political pressure. One item that I'm not particularly um, competent in talking about now, but it will be taken over by Peter later on, is the coastal changes, because having less sea ice, the coastal areas are less protected, and there is more storms coming in, leading to coastal erosion, and some communities in the Arctic need to be relocated. However, there are also, um, especially with the latest programs like Ice Arc, which which is an European Union program, they're making good use of the local communities in Greenland, both by putting instruments on sledges and involving the local communities, and then involving them also in the analysis of the results. And it's really what is considered a win-win situation that is hoped to be carried on in lots of other future programs. And uh, as we've said before, uh, Ice Arc will be discussed as an EU program, a very important EU program, next fri uh, on Friday. Now we talk about the Arctic Council, the Arctic Council, which was founded 20 years ago, and puts together the, all the circumpolar countries that are listed here, and also permanent participants, which are six indigenous groups. On top of that, the Arctic Council has working groups and all the participants uh, belong choosing whatever is their expertise. And they're becoming quite strong, stronger and stronger in regulating the Arctic. Although it doesn't have particular interest in having laws, they consider that the law of the sea is still valid and applicable and can protect enough the Arctic environment. What is interesting is the observers, and if you notice, I put the dates. Nations that asked to be made observers were made to wait quite a long time. I can speak about Italy that was accepted in 2013, and it was a, a process that took at least 12 years. And that's uh, kind of important that, to notice that in 2013, the nations that were elected to be observers were China, Italy, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and India, definitely non-polar countries.
And why is that? Because these countries are considered now the Arctic is not just somewhere up there that doesn't really have any bearing with the rest of the world, but the Arctic is very much part of the world. Here we see, for instance, for exploitation of oil in the Arctic, these are drilling ships that have been laid out for the winter, and in theory with less ice, the oil exploration will be easier, and there will be a platform with an icebreaker circling around to still keep it free of ice. Of course, oil spills is a real danger, and this would be a way to burn it, which, of course, is not something that anybody wishes to happen anyway. Shipping is likely to increase with less sea ice, especially as the northern sea route, a much shorter route between Europe and the Far East, and the Northwest Passage. That last slide that you showed of the burning oil slick, Yes. That's very disturbing because black carbon is said to be one of the, the big problems because that blackens the snow and the ice and makes it melt faster. Absolutely. And also, uh, what can you do if you have a really big oil spill? And in fact, you might want to say what an oil spill did. Uh, yes, in a way, this burning was an early experiment when the oil was deliberately spilled under ice but was constrained within a rubber belt. Um, in fact, you probably won't be able to uh, get oil concentrated enough to burn. Um, and the, the big danger from an oil spill under ice is that it comes up as a bubble plume, like that methane plume that we showed, uh, but it's, it's, metha, it's oil. Uh, it comes under the ice, the ice keeps moving over the top and collecting the oil like a conveyor belt and uh, then the oil is frozen into the ice, you get what's called an oil sandwich with oil, uh, ice, oil and ice. That's carried all around the Arctic and then is d deposited into the ocean when it melts the ice melts the following summer, so you can get a vast diffusion of, of oil all over the Arctic. And what makes the oil companies very much afraid, I think, uh, and maybe led to Shell withdrawing from the Arctic, is that if something like that happened, the cost of cleanup would be greater probably than Deepwater Horizon, and it would be landed on the oil company. So that's been actually one of the most effective reasons why the oil industry is, is not going strongly for the Arctic, is just this fear of the cost of a clean-up if there's an oil blowout. Actually, this is uh, also another problem that we are not really touching very much, mainly through lack of time, is sea level rise. And of course, ice melting from ice caps and glaciers is going to cause that, because our institute in Italy is in central Italy, which is in fact the town of Fermo. It's become a bit more famous, unfortunately, because of the recent earthquakes that are causing a lot of problems in the area. And the Adriatic Sea is very shallow, and Already we see that if there are storms, there's flooding right at the coaster with all the seaside resorts are, and that is another part. And then, uh, as uh, Stuart very nicely considered, uh, the journal Il Polo, that's been published uh, in continuously since 1945. And in a way, we're proving that Italy had interest in the Arctic with uh, our founder, Silvio Zavatti, who founded the Italian Polar Institute in 1944. And I thank you very much much and I carry on with uh, the more science about uh, this problem. Thank you very much. Um, I just mentioned, coming on from what uh, Maria Piers mentioned about sea level rise and how it affects the Mediterranean, which of course one of the threats is to Venice, it's affecting the world um, in a, a very serious way because um, the sea level rise rate has accelerated. and. Um, we see here again IPCC being a bit guilty of excessive complacency. In their 2007 predictions, they were giving very low values for how much sea level rise they thought would occur before the year 2100. They were giving you something like 20 to 40 centimetres. This was because it ignored the melt of the Greenland ice sheet. Now, more recent estimates go much higher, and that's because the cause of sea level rise has two causes. One is the ocean warms up because of the uh, global warming, and that makes the water less dense, so it goes higher. But the other one, and the biggest one now, is what Stuart showed, that um, as the uh, in the summer, 
the warmer air over the Arctic uh, moves over the Greenland ice sheet, causes surface melt, the melt water runs down through the ice sheet and out and uh, causes uh, the glaciers to flow faster, taking more icebergs out to sea and dumping fresh water from land Onto the, into the sea and causing the sea level rise, which is faster uh, now. There's Peter, before, before you leave that last slide, I just want to point out that red line, which is the new IPCC estimates, is still conservative, very conservative in the opinion of many scientists. And the one I will quote is Dr. James Hansen, one of the earliest whistleblowers on the climate problem who is expecting four to five meters by the end of this century. Yes, I mean, there, there are estimates which are much higher because of the way in which, as the Greenland ice sheet melts, the various processes of melt tend to cause that melting to accelerate. And this is just to point out that even a fairly small change in global sea level can have catastrophic implications for the frequency of disastrous floods if you can't afford to raise the height of of your flood defences. So if you're getting, say, a metre rise, then it's all very well in Europe and America, you can, you can raise the heights of your flood defences by a metre, although maybe you can't around Miami or New Orleans. But in a poor country like Bangladesh, where you've got millions of people living right down at sea level and no flood defences, they can't afford to build them, then it has a much bigger effect. So this curve shows on the left a typical range of sea level height at a particular point in the ocean. And the black is where if the sea level is more than a certain limit, it will cause a flood. Now you move the mean, you move the average sea level by adding more water to the ocean, you get the dotted line, and the dotted line, the area that's cross-hatched, is the likelihood of a disastrous flood. It's increased by a very large factor. So what you think of as a small effect, changing the mean, height, sea level height by a small amount, changes the, the probability of having a disastrous flood by a very large amount. So the Bay of Bengal will be getting disastrous floods, which often kill 100,000 people um, more frequently than they do now. Well, we've shown this already, that you can already see changes going on, as well as the retreat of sea ice. Even in the winter, you've now got sea ice much more broken up. The final thing I'd like to mention, how climate change in the Arctic is affecting human beings on Earth. It's likely that the sea ice retreat in the Arctic is causing this effect, which is the jet stream, that's the red and green thing, is um, a streamline of, of very strong winds that separate polar air to the north from tropical air to the south. So you, you know about the jet stream if you take a ride on a plane from Europe to America, it's slower than flying back from America to Europe because this is an easterly flowing wind. Now before you leave that slide, I, I wish this data source was available historically because when I was growing up, the Arctic jet stream was very little wavering. It was a, a, like a, a cap that kept the polar air in from mixing with the uh, temp temperate zone air. But now, I think that's uh, from the work of Dr. Jennifer Francis. Yes, as it slows down, because the Arctic's warming faster than the tropical regions, the temperature difference is going down, and that makes the jet stream flow more slowly, and it, it flows and it becomes unstable and has these big lobes. Now, the, the big lobe, you can see that, that that means polar air in this particular picture. Polar air is coming down to quite low latitudes in the eastern states of the US, and, and tropical air is going up to higher latitudes in the central part of the US. So each part of the US, and in fact this goes all the way around the world, uh, each different longitude region will have either extreme heat or extreme cold. So you're having extreme weather, but if you have extreme heat, this really reduces the yield of most crops. This is showing that beyond one degree of warming, most crops are showing reduced yields. It's only rice that doesn't. And if you look at where these lobes are acting, we're bringing you extreme heat or extreme cold, it's mid-latitudes in the northern hemisphere. And those, as you can see from the, the brown, is, is heavy amounts of, of agriculture. Much of the world's crops are produced in mid-latitudes of the northern hemisphere. And as soon as you interrupt that or in, in really um, mess it up by having these extremes of heat or cold, then you're going to get less crop production, 
even if it doesn't cause actual starvation, it will cause an increase in the price of food. Now, the food price index was brought out by the UN FAO as a, an average price for food throughout the world. And it started at 100 in 2000, and this is where it went. Uh, it got up to 220 in 2008, and that was accompanied by civil unrest in many, many countries. That was where the first Tunisian riots happened. And, of course, there were many reasons for this civil unrest, but one of them was urban populations which were unable to, to buy food um, because the price was so high. And then there was a second peak in 2011, which also was accompanied by a lot of unrest and riots. So food production is something vital to not only keep people alive, but also to, for them to be... Political able to stability. Live better, political yeah. stability. So the food question might be a very serious one because presently people talk about... Um, weather extremes, but the weather extremes have been happening now for about seven or eight years since the Arctic sea ice beca retreat became so dominant. And so once weather happens in a given pattern for that length of time, you start to think about a climate extreme, not a weather extreme. So we have time for a question or maybe two if they're short. I wonder if there is a way to introduce an international law for prevention and in, in any which way, which structures we need uh, participation of the parties in this direction or we can get initiatives from the civil society like for example for you. Law. Well, they dodged that one last year in the Paris Agreement. I think John Kerry said very clearly early on that the U.S. could not go along with anything that was legally binding. So. Uh, Perhaps uh, by citizen initiative, I know there's an ecocide uh, initiative in The Hague, and maybe we can do, do a legal route to trying to make a, a addressing climate change the law. Well, in, in the Arctic, there is uh, this framework that uh, appears described at the Arctic Council of eight nations that have Arctic territory, and that's trying to come up with legally binding frameworks. They've come up with one for search and rescue, and they're coming up with one for regulating uh, oil exploration and dealing with blowouts. So, so that's, if that comes off, that will be, I think, a pretty significant uh, advance. I'm not sure that's going as far as uh, Archbishop Kikotis would like us to go. Again, here's my email address. Now, you feel free to write. We're coming to you from COP22 in Marrakesh, Morocco. Thank you for joining us, and do come back for our future programs. Thank you.